Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Money's with Mover. I am Mover, C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. If you haven't picked up uh, Finney Flight, it is available for pre-order. Uh, we'll be out May 21st along with the paperback. And also, if you're in the audiobooks, uh, I Am the Sheepdog is now available on any audiobook retailer. Uh, should be doing some uh, audiobook giveaways here in the next couple weeks, so stay tuned. Remember, this is an author vlog, so please pick a book up, leave a review. It does help support the channel. On today's episode, uh, I've gotten a lot of questions for the Mover Mailbag about how the Guard Reserve works after you get to your unit and just kind of how the overall process works. So on today's episode, I thought I would just, uh, instead of reading the individual questions and stuff, which I'll do... Uh, uh, on an actual mover mailbag episode. I thought I would just explain uh, for uh, UPT hopefuls how the process works from start to finish and also for people who are thinking about transitioning from the active duty to the reserve component, how the pay statuses work, how, you, uh, how it meshes with an airline job and so forth. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for watching and here we go. So quick review on how the process works. Uh, it's pretty much the same for Air Force Reserve and Air National Guard, so I'm going to speak to it pretty generically. Uh, if you're interested in the Navy, I did the Navy Reserve. Uh, if you're the first time back to the channel, I was uh, Air Force Reserve starting out, then I went uh, Navy Reserve, and now I'm back in the Air Force Reserve. So I've flown F-16s, F-18s, and T-38s uh, all as a reservist, but I've been full-time a lot of that. So how do you get hired? Well, typically speaking, uh, a reserve or guard unit will put out an undergraduate pilot training uh, selection board announcement. They'll say, hey, we're, we're having applicants. Uh, it's usually over a drill weekend, so uh, what they call unit training assemblies, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, or drill weekend, or whatever the, the term is. It's, it differs between on guard reserve and Navy reserve. Now, on the Navy reserve note, there are no off-the-street undergraduate pilot training um, or OCS in the case of the Navy, primary, any of that stuff. You cannot get hired to go fly a fighter or anything in the Navy Reserve off the street. That's exclusively for uh, rated qualified uh, active duty applicants to go to the Navy Reserve. So that's not an option. I'm not going to talk about that. What happens there next is they'll have the board. It's a drill weekend. You'll come out and uh, it's called Rush the Squadron, which is just basically a chance for the squadron to get to know you and for you to get to know the squadron, usually over a three-day period, uh, typically the Friday prior to drill weekend and then Saturday and Sunday of drill weekend. I'll do another video on specifically how to get hired there, but rule number one, like Deuce has talked about, don't be a douche. I mean, that, that will get you through just about everything. So assuming it goes well, you'll get hired and they will extend you an offer to go to pilot training. And once that's done, you'll get all your medical processing, you'll get your flying class one, everything will be taken care of so that you can go uh, to pilot training. So assuming you're medically qualified and all of that works out well, you'll go to uh, officer training school, which is at Maxwell. You will be training with the active duty because OTS is combined, guard, reserve, and active duty. So it's the same officer training school, it's the same commission, is everyone else so same same you'll go back to your unit for a little while while you wait for your pilot training class date uh, at this point you're considered in the pipeline so in the pipeline you've got continuous order so you're not coming off of active duty status or not you are essentially the exact same as an active duty member so uh, and i'll talk about terms later but uh, orders when i talk about orders that means active duty status essentially is what you can consider it so you're on uh, you're paid and treated just like an active duty service member. There is no difference whatsoever. So you're on orders and those pipeline orders will take you all the way to the end of pilot training, even if there's gaps. So it's not like you're going to, you know, have time between schools and be unpaid or whatever. You're going to be an, an active duty uh, service member for all intents and purposes because that's what you are. So you come back to your unit while you wait for uh, pilot training and then you'll go to your pilot training class date. As I've talked about before, the nice thing about pilot training is, although you do have to make the grades, so if you get hired by a fighter unit, you're gonna have to have to make fighter grades. However, you're gonna show up on day one of pilot training knowing that you're gonna fly whatever your unit flies and where your unit flies. So for example, I uh, just got an email from a guy saying that uh, Vermont is having an F-35A undergraduate pilot training board. So. If you get hired on that board, you will know from day one, 
I'm going to go fly the F-35, assuming I make the grades and pass all the courses. So you go to pilot training uh, knowing that, assuming you're going to make those grades. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a load off because you're not competing. It's not needs of the Air Force. You know, I'm going to go to this base and I'm going to fly this aircraft. So that's a really good deal. From there, uh, you go through the entire pipeline. So UPT, IFF, Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals, the Centrifuge, uh, Water Survival, Land Survival, uh, SEER, and then the B course, which is your uh, the school for whatever aircraft you're going to fly. For me, it was the F-16, so I went to an F-16B course at Luke. At this point, you'll show up at your unit. You'll go through what's called Mission Qualification Training, MQT, which will make you a basic wingman. From there, uh, I I'm going to caveat this with it depends. And it's a standard fighter pilot answer, but uh, some units have uh, longer term orders for seasoning, because that's what this is called. Seasoning orders uh, is what you'll start. Uh, some units have 90 days, some units have 180 days, some units 365. Uh, I think most Air Force Reserve fighter units are 1,095 days, so three years. It depends, it changes, it's a moving target, you just don't know. But typically speaking, once you finish your mission qualification, or once you get back to your unit, you're going to start these seasoning orders. And the seasoning orders are, again, full-time active duty status. Um, you know, fighters get a little bit more than, than heavies, I think. I don't know, I've never been in a heavy unit. There's nothing wrong with it, I just don't know. So I'm only gonna talk to fighters. So let's assume, like me, you get 1,095 days of seasoning. So you go through those three years of orders, and by this time, you should be uh, a flight lead, maybe an instructor pilot in the aircraft, uh, you should have a, a, a fair amount of hours uh, because at this point, from the day you got uh, you, you got your commission to this point, it's about five years total because three years of seasoning plus two years of uh, training because it takes about two years from the time you commission to the time you uh, finish your F-16, F-35, whatever. And those times can vary depending on how long the, the wait is between classes and all that stuff. But typically speaking, five years. So you're at the five year point, now what? And this part is not just for UPT hopefuls, this is for active duty guys wanting to transition too because this is gonna to apply to anybody. There are, there are many options once your seasoning runs out. Uh, you could take what's called an AGR. So um, it's a uh, guard reserve, active guard reserve uh, position which is a full time, you're treated like active duty uh, on orders. So in the Air Force Reserve has them, and the Guard, the Air National Guard has them. I'm not going to get into Title 10, Title 32 because I think that complicates things a little bit too much for this discussion. But just think of AGR as a full-time active duty position within the squadron. So your job is same thing it's always been: to fly. You might have a scheduling job, you might have safety job, weapons job, whatever. You're gonna have a job within the squadron and you're gonna fly, just, as, just the same as if you were active duty. The only difference is you're not gonna uh, do a permanent change of station or PCS every two years. You know, your AGR will go uh, three to five years and at the end of that you can either uh, extend, get a new one, or you can decide, hey, I don't wanna do this anymore and do what's called a curtailment. So the AGR is one pay status that you can do. The second one is called a technician, air reserve technician, an art job. An art job is typically, uh, that's, this has changed a lot since I was uh, growing up in the fighter community because when I showed up in the reserve unit, it was called a baby art job and that was the stupidest thing in the world because they started you as a GS-9 uh, when you first got out of training. You didn't get any seasoning days. They started you as a GS-9, then they made you a GS-11 based on hours, then they made you a GS-12 once you made flight lead, then they made you a GS-13 uh, once you made instructor pilot. I think that's gone away because cooler heads prevailed. They're just going from seasoning to GS-13. But you have the technician job. It's a GS-13. There's a flying bonus. Uh, so if you look at the GS-13 pay scales, it's roughly equivalent to major pay. Uh, it's, you get the a locality plus a bonus. Uh, but the thing is, the thing to understand, what does it mean? What does a technician job mean? You are a federal civil servant. So it is tied to your reserve job. And what that means is you are doing a time card and you are a civilian wearing the uniform, flying every day, and then you take leave to go do your military status. So it's kind of weird, but just think of it as a federal civil service job. And some 
guard units require you to do a certain amount of time as a technician, then become an AGR uh, after I guess you've proven your worth. I think a lot of units are going away from that just going straight AGR, but it still does exist and it's called an art, a technician job. If you decide to become a part-timer at this point and you decide, hey, I wanna to go to the airlines or whatever, you can do that. Uh, and so how do you get paid when you come to work? And that's something people are always asking, you know, am I gonna get paid uh, when I go? So you can take short-term orders, which is less than uh, 30 days. So with short-term er orders, you only get BAH type two, which is not the full uh, allowance for housing. You can take long-term orders, so 31 days or greater, in which case you're gonna get full TRICARE uh, as if you're active duty. You are basically an active duty service member at that point. Uh, and you'll get the full BAH and all that stuff. You can take uh, your annual tour. Annual tour is training orders that you are allotted every year. Uh, it's for two weeks plus, uh, I think two to three travel days added to that. So it's about 16 days and they can go up to I think 29 days. Well, that's just an allotment you get every year to use. So you get two weeks of orders. And the Navy Reserve, the Guard, and the Air Force Reserve all have annual tour. So that's all the same. The, then you have unit training assemblies, drill weekend, uh, everybody calls it something different. The Navy has that, the Air Force Reserve and Air Guard both have that. So you get uh, two days, which a month, which are broken down into UTAs, so drill periods, and each drill period pays one day of pay. So it's kind of confusing, right? So uh, let's say you make uh, $200 a day not including incentive pay or anything it's like that. You just make $200 a day if you're on orders. Well, uh, a UTA is two of those. So uh, on Saturday, you'll make 400 bucks and on Sunday, you'll make 400 bucks because that's four drill periods for that weekend. A lot of units allow you to reschedule that. Uh, there are uh, classic associate units, which mean that the uh, Air Force owns the aircraft and the reserves are just integrated. A lot of those just want you to be there during the week, so they let you reschedule. There's no real weekend drills, except for maybe quarterly. There are active associate units where the reserves own the airplanes, uh, like Homestead and Carswell, and those do have stable drill weekends and, and all the stuff you'd think about. So they want you to be there on the drill weekends, and that's every month. So you get 48 of those, uh, which works out to 24 days, which is two days a month. That's your drills. So at the bare minimum, you're always going to have 48 drills and two weeks of annual tour. Now, uh, as a pilot, you have to stay current. You have to fly. So if you don't take orders, which orders can be as short as one day, uh, you do what's called uh, additional flying training periods, additional ground training periods, AFTP, AGTP. For those, for the Air Force Reserve, you get 48 a year and you can only use 16 of those per quarter. Um, and so that kind of hamstrings you a little bit, but essentially that gives you, um, it's the exact same as a, a, a UTA. So one AFTP is one day of pay, you can do two in a day. So that's, you know, if you're making $200 per AFTP, you can do $400 a day, uh, gross obviously. So you can combine if you fly twice. So every time you fly, you do an additional flying training period. So uh, most units require you to get a minimum number of sorties per month. In that case, you would get um, to get your, your wrap is what it's called. To get that done, you would fly, let's say five times, five times in a month. You only get paid if you actually get gear in the well. Intent to fly does not work in the Air Force Reserve. So the rules kind of, get you in a square corner, they're not that great, but uh, you get two a day and you can either do one flight and do an a additional flying training period and then an AGTP, which is uh, for mission planning, for brief, for debrief, uh, ground related stuff to go do medical, all that stuff. So you can get two per day for that. Uh, but you can't do two AGTPs per day. Guard reserve differ between the two. Some guard units allow 72 AFTPs 
and the Navy Reserve allows 72, and they don't have a 16 per quarter restriction. They don't have any of these restrictions. It's just you get 72. So uh, on the Navy Reserve side and the Guard side, it's a little bit better because the rules are not as strict and you can do more flying training periods. You also have what's called readiness manage management periods, which allow you to do paperwork and stuff. They cannot be flying related. Uh, it's just another pay status, but you can only do one a day. So as you can see, just as a part-timer, there are many ways to get paid just doing what's required to stay current. Now, will you get paid full-time? No, the only way to get paid full-time is to go on full-time orders. But if you are just trying to have it as an additional income because you're an airline pilot or you wanna stay current, you will get paid for doing that. So that's pay. Um, I know it's kind of convoluted. A lot of people don't understand it. Sometimes I get confused with it. But the biggest thing to realize is if as a traditional reservist or a drill status guardsman, you are coming into the squadron and flying anywhere from uh, minimum, you know, so some units, and it's all unit dependent. So some units say, hey, I want you here five days a month. Some units say, hey, I want you, you know, six to nine days a month because they're a fighter unit, they require more uh, sorties. The more junior you are and the more inexperienced you are in the aircraft, the more sorties you're gonna have to fly per month. So as a Part-timer, uh, your requirement may be more if you're a junior guy, but it may be down to the four to five days a month if you can fly twice and the weather's good and all that stuff. Uh, if you're a more senior and you're doing another job like airline pilot or financial management. On that note, a lot of you have asked, uh, you've talked about, well, I've got this side business, can I do it as a reservist? The answer is yes. However, some jobs are more military friendly than others. Airline pilot, uh, being an airline pilot's great because you have a more flexible schedule, you can travel, you don't have to necessarily be co-located. Uh, words of wisdom uh, or good advice, always live at least one. I don't take this advice because uh, I'm, I'm dumb and I really should, but it's better to live in your, your base, where you're based, than to commute for two jobs. So if you can live at least in your airline domicile or where your reserve unit is, your life's gonna be so much better because you can just drive to your guard unit or reserve unit, go fly and go home at night and then maybe go commute to your airline job. The best of both worlds is to live where you're based and drill where you're based. So, you know, Carswell is a great one because they, they live in Fort Worth and if you're flying for American or Southwest or one of those, you can be based in Dallas. So best of both worlds, have everything in one place, but if you can't, at least have one where you live so you're not double commuting for both of them. So um, how much your unit requires of you is just gonna depend on, on that. People have always also asked, Will I deploy? Will I go to combat? And the answer is yes. So as a reservist, um, I was probably the first person in my pilot training class to deploy because when I came back from uh, the F-16 basic course, I did my MQT and immediately went to support Operation Iraqi Freedom because the unit was deploying. Units typically deploy on a cycle. This changes often. Uh, the rules are, are changing, but it used to be every 18 months when we were back in the uh, OIF, OEF, Iraq, and Afghanistan role. Now it kind of depends. Sometimes they go do uh, other deployments which aren't necessarily to the sandbox, you know, Europe, uh, stuff like that. So it depends and the rotations have changed a little bit. But you can expect to deploy uh, on a normal rotation. You will be part of that. The unit I'm in now doesn't because we're T-38s and you can't really deploy a T-38. Uh, yes, you will deploy. Yes, you will fly normal missions. Uh, the F-16s, the F-35, especially the ones integrated with the active duty squadron. It is just a different set of patches. There's no difference between you and, as far as qualifications go, there's no mission difference between you and the active duty person. So other than pay status and what patches you're wearing, uh, it's in fact, the reserves guys usually have more experience because they've been there longer. They're not PCSing every two to three years, uh, but they're, they're there. Uh, for example, in my T-38 squadron, the reserves are typically the instructor pilots and the evaluators because the active duty is so young because it's mostly you know young lieutenants coming through our reserve adversary squadron and we're the ones training them. So th there's definitely, um, it's not just a flying club. There is definitely a mission and it, it will depend on what unit you go to. For example, if you go to a guard unit, 
uh, for uh, like the uh, Louisiana Air Guard, they fly F-15s and they do alert. So they have an alert mission with full-time guys that are guardsmen that um, rotate in and out sitting 24-hour alert down in New Orleans in case they have to do some kind of air defense mission. So there are plenty of opportunities and there's plenty of uh, ways that you can continue to serve in a full-time manner uh, even though you're a reservist. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not necessarily like a lot of people think one week in a month, two weeks a year, it's far from that. Even as a part-timer, you're gonna be doing a lot more than one week in a month, two weeks a year. I think that just about answers all the questions. Uh, you know, a lot of people are asking about pay status. So yes, you can get paid. Yes, you can be full-time. You can show up uh, from your unit. Uh, from training and just be a full-time, you can retire with a 20-year active duty retirement. A lot of guys do that. So that's definitely a possibility. You can be a part-timer. Uh, there is what's called USERA. So the federal law mandates that employers give reservists time to go do reserve duty. So they can't fire you for going and doing your reserve job. With that said, what I was getting to earlier, it's easier as an airline pilot. However, uh, it can be done as, you know, if you're a financial person or if you've got some kind of normal nine to five job, it can be done. It's just a lot harder because you're going to have to basically give a week or two uh, every month to get away from your job and go maintain your currency and then come back. Uh, if it's something you can work on on the road, you can telecommute and stuff, it's a lot easier. So uh, airline pilot's the easiest, but that's not to say you can't have another job. Uh, it's plenty of people do it. It's just, you know, it's, it's easier if you live in base if you're doing that. Uh, so yes, you can have another job. Yes, you can get paid. Yes, you will promote. You'll promote on the same schedule as everybody else. You'll, you know, two years to second lieutenant, two years to captain, uh, and then normal promotion cycles for 04, 05, 06. They still make you do, do uh, PME, professional military education, so you're still gonna have to go do all that stuff. But, um, you know, there, there's definitely opportunities. Navy Reserve is pretty much the same. There are fewer fighter units that you can go to. I mean, there's only two that actually own their own iron, the uh, VFC-12, VFA-204, and then you've got the uh, F-5 units uh, down in Key West and at Fallon that you can go to. But there aren't as many opportunities. It still exists. Uh, but the pay is pretty much the same. So the pros of the Guard or Reserve or the Air Reserve component, uh, you know where you're going to be based. You know what you're going to fly. You don't have to move if you don't want to. Now, granted, you're still at the mercy of the Air Force or what's going on. Units close, and if a unit closes, you're going to have to go find another job. Uh, it also depends on the economy. The technician jobs and the AGR jobs are easier to come by when the airlines are doing really well because most people want to go fly for the airlines and just fly for fun as a hobby. If, as in the lost decade from you know 2001, 2011, 12-ish, when the airlines are doing poorly and guys are getting furloughed from their airline job, they typically hang out in the unit and they will take up those jobs. So. If like when I first showed up, um, technician jobs were really hard to come by and getting orders was really hard to do. So it's not always guaranteed, it just depends. And if your unit goes away, you may have to go find another place in another unit. Now, transferability. People have asked me, well, hey, you know, you flew F-16s, can I go fly um, you know, F-15s later and stuff? It's possible. You can absolutely go um, from one unit to the next and you're going to have to go through the same process. You're going to have to rush the unit. You're going to have to, uh, you know, basically give them your resume, get interviewed and convince them that they should hire you. Units are typically less likely to do that just because, you know, by the time you hit the, the 03, 04 point, you should be seasoned in your aircraft, and it's a lot harder to make that, make that argument, but it does happen depending on manning, depending on uh, how many pilots that they need, and whether you're, you know, abiding by rule one, which is don't be a douchebag. If you're a good dude or girl, and you show up to a, a unit, they like you, yeah, they'll put you through a transition course and you can go fly something else. My advice though is don't go chasing aircraft. One of the things I wish I had done was stuck around a, a year or two more at Homestead and not uh, now, I was trying to transition back to Louisiana specifically for family reasons, but if I had stayed a year or two more at the F-16 unit and become an instructor pilot in the F-16, I'd have had many, many more doors open for me 
later down the road than only having a four ship flight lead qualification. So get as many qualifications as you can in your current aircraft before you go uh, looking for another job or looking for another place because you know it's all about resume, it's all about uh, what you can offer to the, the unit, what you can bring to the table. Um, you know, it's just, just a lot easier for you. So um, maybe not, and, and I definitely wouldn't be advertising from day one that, hey, I wanna go fly this specific aircraft. Love the one you're with, make the best out of it, do a good job where you are, and then that will open doors for you later on. Uh, and if all else fails, make them tell you no. You know, it's the same thing. Once you're an experienced fighter pilot, and you want a certain job, you're, you're gonna have to make them tell you no. Ask the question, don't self-eliminate. Even if you think it's unlikely, still try because sometimes it just takes you being persistent and they will um, give you a shot and make it, make it work even if you're not necessarily qualified for the job uh, initially. So, uh, hope that helps, hope that answers a lot. I know it's kind of confusing, but there are a lot of different pay statuses and stuff and, and you'll figure it out once you get to the unit. Nobody expects you to know it right off the bat, but just know that yes, you will be flying just like your active duty counterparts and you will get be getting paid for doing so. So, hope this uh, episode helps. Got a lot of exciting things coming up. I'm not gonna spoil it, but uh, kind of a big announcement coming up in the next a uh, couple episodes. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.